is ambiguous thinking useful? Because I'm doing a series on mature economics where one of the big parts of that is developing a flexibility of thought where you're thinking of things kind of ambiguously. Is somebody being selfish or altruistic? Well, you're letting that be ambiguous. Maybe it's both at once. Maybe it's, um, maybe you can't lock that down. What about deliberative behavior? What about competition versus cooperation? You're thinking really ambiguously about human drives and about a lot of the different components in economics. And one reaction people have to this sometimes is that's not useful. It's too nebulous. You can't do anything with that. And I want to make an argument against that in this video. I actually think this is essential for actually making better maps. So, um, I have four arguments here. One is reality is always useful and reality is ambiguous. When you look at people's real human behavior, sometimes it's genuinely ambiguous whether they're being selfish or altruistic. Sometimes you can't tell, sometimes they can't tell. And um, one of the things about observing reality, bringing it back to our maps, because economic models are maps, and updating our maps based on what we've observed in reality and then checking our updates against reality, that process that I call the reality sandwich, reality maps reality, that is how you update your models and that's how you develop out your maps of the world so that you're not just stuck with the most simplistic versions of the maps that you learn in an econ textbook, but you can develop maps that take into account your unique perspective, the unique circumstances that you've observed, the intuition you've developed over time for what motivates human behavior. You want your maps to be constantly updating as you encounter more evidence in the real world and all of that. So developing better maps over time is one reason why you wanna keep your thinking flexible is because it, it better allows you to recognize, oh, this thing that was on my map that I had locked down for use. It's not as simple as I thought. As a matter of fact, it might be better modeled in a different way in a different circumstance. And allowing that flexible thinking will allow you to notice when do you need to update your map or use a different map for this particular situation. A second and kind of related reason for flexible thinking is you want to ask when you're using the maps, the models you build of economics, when does this theory apply? And when would a different economic theory, perhaps that you've developed or that somebody else has developed, when would that theory apply better? And this depends on the certain conditions that you're looking at that, that determine when will something apply well. It will also help you think about when have the conditions of the environment changed so that the, the model we use should actually change as well. And to explain that, I want to give sort of two examples. One is like the classic econ way of thinking about things is you have a setup where you've got a salesman and the salesman is on a commission basis. So the more he sell sells, the more, um, more money he makes. And what does this salesman care about given that money is a secondary motivator and we're trying to develop out our thinking? What motivates this salesman? Well, it's the classic, he cares about his family. And so he's just maximizing profits. He's selling stuff. Um, just for the purpose of investing that in his family. And one thing we notice about this situation is that um, he's a fairly straightforward case because what he cares about when he's maximizing profits for himself or maximizing his revenue is outside of the system. It's not within the system. So the maximizing profits, since he doesn't care that much about what he's selling, he's not uh, he doesn't feel moral um, qualms about the thing he's selling. That would be something that's inside the system of the uh, company he belongs to. It's fairly straightforward. Whereas over here we have a situation where there's a pyramid industry, and I'm going to use Hollywood as an example, where why do people get in at the bottom layer of Hollywood and work grueling hours for low pay, they're getting people's coffee and doing things like that, uh, why do they do that? Is it for the money? Is it is it for the probability of making a lot of money? And the answer is no. The reason they get in on this game is not related to the money. It's related to sort of the hope of power and creative license and the good stuff that would happen if they reach the top of that pyramid industry. 
So first of all, if we're stuck on this model of how people work and what motivates people, we're not going to understand people at the ground layer of the pyramid industry. We're just, we're not going to accurately predict our, their behavior because we need a different model. And the flexibility of thought that goes along with why is somebody entering an industry and working really hard um, requires us to move into a different model over here. But then the other thing is, let's say we track people, they're in their 20s, they're working really hard in Hollywood trying to move up, and let's say they sort of reach some rung in the middle somewhere in their 40s, and it turns out at that point um, the, the industry may actually need to pay them for their skills because at this point they may be kind of disillusioned about the industry. The hopes they had for reaching these executive positions with creative license, they may have watched the situation around them and come to terms with actually no, you don't really move up unless you have connections and all that stuff. So their motivations have changed and that's going to essentially change the structure of the game in the, for the middle people in this industry compared to people lower down in the industry. And when you're trying to figure out which model applies to figuring out how does this game work, what's motivating people, what, how will they respond to money, what do they need in terms of compensation or in terms of hopes for moving up to actually do the work in that spot in the industry, uh, you have to watch and, and change your map as the positions change or as time goes on. And in a lot of ways, that's what economic modeling is about. It's about looking at the real situation and recognizing when when is a new model needed? When, when is there change and how we need to be thinking about this situation? So developing an ambiguous way that you think about these different parts of the economic model will allow you the flexibility to actually figure out the right model to apply in the situation. And I already mentioned that flexible thinking allows you to better update your maps as you look at reality and develop new insight. Um, my last point here is that you're better able to participate in the discourse if you have flexible thinking. Because a lot of times, uh, mature economists will have very different ways of conceptualizing what's going on. And if you bring like an Econ 101, this sort of situation understanding into hearing what an advanced economist is saying, you may actually miss what they're really saying. So to participate in the conversation, you need to come in with a flexible mind, being like, okay, I kind of have a ballpark for what they're talking about. They are talking about human motivation, but they will have their own take on that. And my flexible listening to this person will better allow me to converse with them and to be part of the discourse.